what you can and can't do. Okay. Can't do with the specimens, so mm -hmm. it, it evolves. Yeah, it's all. So we just have a small museum and we just are very curious to know because when I was also planning this early, early stages, you know, how the earth came into being, you know, and how the water came and then how the life came. And then it is just, uh, and then you came. <laughs> so it was fun, you know. So yeah, let's you know, it's, it's a great story. It really uh, is. So I'm, so, I'm glad that you're, you know, uh, helping people to understand it. I think I think we start with the uh, we start with 14.6 billion years, then all of a sudden we'll come to 4.6 billion years, then 3.5 we will billion years, and then water comes, and then the life comes, and anaerobic environment, then molecular. So I was just uh, when I was just reading through you uh, your works, you know, I could just associate the feelings <laughs> directly what you might have, but but tremendous job, you know, you have you have just done uh, I think what what incredible work you have done in uh, well i appreciate that year. because i, appreciate I was in a, in a, in chitra code you know for for a, for a national uh, for a discovery channel they was they were shooting something and then we found some stromatolites and then some discs and then uh, at the uh, huge i had never seen such a big big uh, stromatolites in my life you know yeah. huge yeah. maybe around uh, 3 3 5 5 meters Oh yes, no, no. There, uh, I'll I'll show some reefs today okay. that are pretty spectacular. Mm. Good evening, Doctor Arya. So, uh, uh, Andrew, uh, you, we just start now. I Whenever think. you what, care to go, I'm yeah, ready. It's, it's seven, you know. So we just start at it. Huh? Okay. So, uh, Doctor Kishan Khan will inter introduce about the museum. Then I will tell you something about you, whatever I'm. <laughs> and then you can just start your presentation. Sure. Okay. Over to you, Dr. Kishindan. Yeah, very good evening to all who are present here and uh, welcome to today's program that is being held uh, by the Tethys Fossil Museum. Of course, a uh, grand, grand effort that is being uh, done in establishing this wonderful institution. Dr. Arya, I must congratulate you for that. Uh, this webinar is a monthly endeavor. This is being organized by members of Tethys Fossil Museum and Research Center. Uh, this museum as such is coming up uh, in Himachal Pradesh at a place called Dangyari, which is in Solan district. And uh, Kusali Tehsil is there where it is coming up. Uh, geologically, museum is located on the debris concealing the Dakshai Sabatu boundary it signifies closure of Tethys Sea and evolution of terrestrial ecosystem. Uh, museum is built from 20 million year rock of Kasoli sandstone, beautifully chiseled to give museum an aesthetic look. Water which we drink in the museum is from a bore well drilled into 40 million years old white quartzite sandstone, which is marked by a bed extending from Pakistan to Burma in the least. Tethys Museum will display diverse, well-preserved fossils of stromatolite, edlacara, tribolite, mollusk, ammonites, etc. from Spiti Valley, fishes, whales, sharks, oysters, molluscan, foraminera from Sabatu and Leh. All this effort by Dr. Arya and his team, wonderful, wonderful things that have been displayed here. Plant remains consisting of logs of trees, leaves, flowers, roots, etc. from Kusoli, and Dharamshala, these are two regions in Himachal Pradesh only in India, and mammals from Shivalik, signifying gradual evolution of life on this planet, and all are part of the museum repository. So anyone visiting the museum will have a glimpse of how different fossils collected from different geological formations across the Himalayas can help to rebuild the entire paleo history of the historical events, various events, which led to the evolution, as we all know, was an ocean once upon a time separating India from Tibet, Eurasia. As the Indian plate moved northward, the Tethys Sea squeezed, and when the two plates collided and the Tethyan sediments were uplifted, 
forming the mighty Himalayas that we come across today. Lots of research has been done in timing the collision of the two plates leading to the evolution and birth of death in Himalayas. But still, there is no consensus and there are Himalayan opportunities for researchers to come up with a convincing model to time the collision and explain the birth of the Himalayas. Keeping this in mind, the Organizing Committee of Tethys Fossil Museum and Research Center, they have decided to host a series of lectures of which today's lecture is a part by veteran geologists, those who have worked a lot in this field, who dedicated their lives to understanding this geomechanism. This effort has been done by Dr. Arya in which we are working and today's program is a part of that. Dr. Arya, over to you, kindly introduce the host and uh, uh, the guest we have today and uh, kindly begin with the proceedings. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shankar. So today we have uh, Professor Andrew Noll, who's Fisher Professor of Natural History at Howard University. He is winner of this year's Crawford Award and author of A Brief History of Earth, Four Billion Years in Eight Chapters. We welcome Professor Andrew Noll. He has been awarded by Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, the prestigious Trefford Prize, which is a precursor to a Nobel Prize. He has been awarded for his work in illuminating the first three boring billionaires of Earth history, determining the ages of bedrocks, discovering tiny organisms from depths of time that are infant decimal ancestors of everyone and are explaining the third mass extinction. He had tried to integrate all the available data, geological, biological, chemical, and puts everything in right perspective. He is able to make a holistic picture, understand why fossil is there and content of everything that's going on. <clears throat> Since childhood, Andrew Noll was mesmerized by fossils. At tender age of 12, he was fascinated by the fossils. And that was wonderful for him. And he still gets excited in his discoveries and something or have an idea that no one else had done earlier. He applied his knowledge of early life to specimens from Mars. So he has applied studying, I think, uh, astrobiology, sort of. And um, he was one of the first persons to use carbon isotopes to understand how much carbon dioxide and oxygen were there in atmosphere at any point of time. He effectively used carbon element to understand environmental history. According to him, it's getting warmer because we are moving a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So right from three billion years to today, his research continues to explain the past and links it with the present and has solutions for the future. His most credible explanation for Earth's third and biggest mass extinction, the Great Dying, when 90% of species in ocean and 70% on land disappeared at the end of Permian, around 252 million years ago. The simple explanation was rapid rise in carbon dioxide. And group more tolerant to carbon dioxide survived and others became extinct. Siberian traps was the reason for the increase in carbon dioxide. So simple are his explanations that it really encourages anyone who's, who's willing to understand Mother Earth right from how it originates, how the life forms comes, how they diversify, how they became extinct, and how small as a human being we are in this whole history of the evolution so I don't take much time. 
because all his achievements, all his works are so long. And I just end by his, by his own quote, by Andrew Knoll's own quote, and that is, we live in a microbial planet. Animals are really the icing on evolution cakes, but bacteria are the cake. And now I welcome Andrew Knoll to have the slice of those, those cakes, which you have mustered in the last, I think, uh, maybe around 70 years. Not that much. <laughs> so we are going to have those slices of those uh, cake today, the microbial cakes. So over to you, and you know, and we are eager to listen to you. Thank you. Okay, let, let me just share my screen. Uh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. So oh, okay, okay, okay. Just, you're going to have to. Nope. Okay. Now we're looking better. Let's see. Um, now I just have to get the right file up. Okay. Sorry, I've uh, been doing nothing but Zoom for the last two years and it's still- uh, okay. No problem, take it. your time. Stop for just a second. So is, is it okay? Can you share it now? Um, no, I've been having troubles getting the, uh, the screen up. Let's see. Sorry to be uh, taking so much time here, but let's see if this works. Okay. Now let's see what happens. Well, this is, yeah, there we go. And let me just do this. I think we're just about there. Okay, can everyone see that? All right, well, uh, thank you, Ritesh, for that very kind introduction. I, I'm glad to be with everyone this evening, even if it's just virtually. And <laughs> I am, in fact, going to talk about a body of work that has been a, a major part of, of my professional career, uh, really for my whole professional life. And, and that is what's often called the early history of life. And if nothing else, I hope to convince you uh, today that it is better thought of as most of the history of life. So let's start with something we all know, if I can get this to advance. There we go. Um, everyone knows that there's a fossil record. And if you only know one thing about the fossil record, you know that it includes these magnificent and improbable beasts called dinosaurs, which lived between about 240 and 66 million years ago. If you know a little bit more about the fossil record, you may know that at the time when dinosaurs were the dominant terrestrial animals, a major group in the seas was an extinct relative of the uh, squids and, and octopus called ammonites, and you can see a coiled shell of an ammonite uh, to its right. And if you know even a little bit more, you know that there's a history of animal life that extends deeper into time, well beyond the records of dinosaurs and ammonites. And what I, you show, I show in the bottom there is a trilobite, uh, a group of arthropods that uh, have really originated more than 500 million years ago. Now, I'd like to take just a moment to put that record of animals into perspective, actually in both time and space. Uh, I'm very fond of the diagram in the, in the upper left. It is an attempt by my friend Ron Milo at the Weizmann Institute in Tel Aviv and his colleagues to actually quantify 
the distribution of biomass on, on this planet. And what you can see is that most of the biomass on this planet, according to their estimates, is actually plants with bacteria second and then fungi, another group of organizationally simple organisms called archaea, protozoa, and algae. And that little red block in the, up, in the upper right of that figure is animals. Now, animals are much less than 1% of all biomass on this planet. Now, it, it turns out that plants cheat in the sense that if you look at a tree outside your window, uh, more than 90% of the mass of that tree will not consist of living tissues. Wood is a tissue that actually doesn't become functional until the cells that made, made the wood die. If you only look at the um, living tissues in a plant, then bacteria are the in terms of biomass, the dominant organisms on the planet. And however you treat plants, animals remain a small portion of, of Earth's uh, biomass. Now, if we look below that, you'll see what's often called a universal tree of life. It is a hypothesis of the evolutionary relationships of all organisms based on comparison of molecular sequences. And uncontroversially, there are three major branches of that tree, the bacteria, which are pretty much as advertised, uh, the archaea, which is another group of so-called prokaryotic or simply organized cells, uh, only recognized as distinct from bacteria in 1977. And then there are the eukaryotes, that is organisms with a membrane bound nucleus, much like our own cells. Um, this particular diagram called, shows the archaea and the eukaryotes as being so-called sister groups, that is, descended from a common ancestor. I think most evidence now suggests that eukaryotes actually represent a merger of different cells that include archaea and bac bacteria. So the complexity of eukaryotes arises in a very specific way. Now, Although there's a lot of controversy about individual branching relationships on this diagram, one thing is clear, and that is all of the animals that are living, all of the fossils of animals reside on one small distal branch of that tree. And that suggests that there's a deeper history of life that goes well beyond the fossil record of animals and the inference we would take from this uh, evolutionary tree is that deeper history is mostly microbial. So then let's just look at the, the right-hand diagram, which is simply a timeline of Earth history. You can see there that our oldest fossil evidence for animals is in rocks that are about 575 million years ago, but our planet itself is more than four and a half billion years. And so the question is, what actually occurred in terms of life during that long interval of time that separates the origin of the planet from the uh, first appearance of, of animals. And again, based on comparative biology, one would predict that if there is a deeper history of life, it will be a microbial history and we have to look at it using appropriate techniques. So in many ways, my own journey in, into trying to understand the deep past began in another improbable place, the island of Spitsbergen, which sits about halfway between the northern tip of Norway and the North Pole. And you can see from these shots of Spitsbergen during midsummer that it's you know not a very inviting place. It's more or less like the Alps at sea level, glaciated throughout. Uh, in order to get around a Spitsbergen, you either have to use a boat and go to coastal exposures or get flown in by helicopter. And then the helicopter drops you off with a couple of weeks of food and you move back and forth using skis or, or snowshoes. Now, the reason to be excited about Spitsbergen is that there are remarkable exposures of very well-preserved rocks that at least the ones that I've worked on, were between about 800 and 720 million years old. These are older than any rocks that contain, you know, shells or bones, any rocks that contain 
tracks or trails of, of animals. So it's a good place to, to ask the question, can we actually see evidence of life before animals? So the question is, how do we do that? Now, if you look in the upper right, that's just an outcropping of rock in, in Spitsbergen, and you'll see right away that it has sort of wavy laminae in it. These are limestones or their equivalents. And it turns out that if you go to a place like the Bahama Banks today, you'll see very similar features in accumulating lime muds. And that the waviness comes because there is an alternation of sedimentation events when mud is brought in and the establishment of mat-like microbial communities. And they actually give shape to the textures that we see. So right away, a geologist who has learned how to read the rock record, if you will, can make the inference that there was microbial life at this place at the time these rocks were deposited. There's also an interesting feature in the upper center of that uh, picture, just an upward bowing area that's called a TP structure by geologists. And those sorts of things occur in a very specific setting. That is along the more exposed areas of tidal flats where the area is wetted for only a few hours a day, evaporation of the water actually leads to the precipitation of calcium carbonate minerals within the, the sediment. And the pressure of that causes the sediment surface to buckle. So seeing that feature really designates the environment that is represented by these rocks. Now, if you want to look for evidence of ancient life, you might just take a piece of that carbonate rock, make a so-called thin section, that is a paper thin slice of it and look at it under the microscope. And all you would see is interlocking crystals of carbonate minerals. On the other hand, if you look at those black nodular areas there, those are nodules of so-called chert, that's uh, silicon dioxide, uh, it's very fine grained quartz. And those formed within the sediment soon after it was deposited. And those, that chert has this wonderful property of preserving depositional textures, including uh, microbial textures at a very fine scale. So if you look at that underneath the microscope, you'll see things like the image in the, the lower right. Uh, those are fossil cells. Each of them is about five microns in diameter. And these represent ancient photosynthetic bacteria, so-called cyanobacteria um, that were in the mat community at the time it formed. So these rocks tell us two things. One is they tell us that by looking at the physical and chemical features of the rock itself, we can make some meaningful statements about environment in the past and that microbial organisms actually can leave a fossil record. And sometimes we can say quite a bit about that record. So for example, in Spitsbergen and many other places of, of comparable age, there are these interesting uh, microfossils that uh, are on the order of 35 microns across. You can see there are a number of more or less concentric uh, laminations that surround the, the cell itself, and those are elongated in the downward direction to form a stalk. And those organisms can be found as individuals, but commonly they're found in, in clusters or crusts. And in fact, we can, you know, based on the fossils themselves, we can reconstruct a simple life cycle, such as you see in the bottom. Now, armed with what we know about environment, we can go to modern environments of similar uh, environmental circumstance. And so this uh, is a place in the Bahama Banks. And what you see in the intertidal zone there on the right are these little black crusts. And those black crusts are made up of stalk forming cyanobacteria, such as you see in the lower left, and they are a spitting image in terms of both morphology and life cycle to the fossil populations that are, you know, nearly 800 million years old. So what that tells us is that under favorable circumstances, we can actually go a fairly long way in interpreting some of these ancient fossils. 
And it turns out that if you look in a variety of different kinds of rocks representing a variety of different marine environments in these rocks from Spitsbergen, there's quite a diversity of life represented, both cyanobacteria, which you see in these uh, images on the right, but also fossils of eukaryotic organisms. So for example, in the upper center, there's a vase-shaped fossil about 100 microns long, uh, which is very similar to a number of organisms that make vase-shaped protective tests today. Uh, in the left, we see early green algae. Uh, and in the bottom, there's a remnants of a cell that we don't really know what made it, but it's about half a millimeter in diameter and clearly has an internal uh, cyst or spore inside it. So the first thing we learned then is that there is a record that tells us something about the diversity of life before the advent of animals. There's more. Um, it turns out that while reefs today are made mostly by corals and other sorts of, of, of animals and algae, organisms have been making reef-like structures for nearly the entire history of our planet. So what you're looking at in the upper left, in that cliff wall, you'll see there's a series of more or less elongate uh, structures, kind of buff colored. And those are actually reefs built by microbes. Uh, these are called stromatolites. You've already heard that word in the, the opening remarks. And what you see on the right is a group of 800 million year old stromatolites. And they diagnostically have these upward bending laminated structures that represent the accretion through time of sediment through the trapping and binding by microbes. And we know a lot about stromatolites and how they form because there are still places on earth today where we can actually see stromatolite biology in action. And what you see in the lower left is a place called Shark Bay in, in Western Australia, which is really one of the most important uh, places to look at modern microbial mats. And they allow us to interpret these fossils with confidence. And those fossils tell us that throughout the photic zone from the inner tidal to the depths of penetration of light in the oceans, there were microbial communities on the surface. And then finally, there are chemical clues to life. Uh, in some cases, not in Spitsbergen, but in other rocks of similar age, we have preserved molecules actually made by organisms. Uh, I always tell my students that uh, when they die, the last part of them that will be around for people to contemplate will be their cholesterol because cholesterol and other so-called sterols actually preserve pretty well in the geologic record. And we do have records of different kinds of sterols talking about, which tell us about different kinds of uh, eukaryotes in rocks of this age. Uh, there are pigments that tell us about different kinds of photosynthesis and, and related um, metabolisms. And actually bacteria make diagnostic biomolecules as well. So that chemical record augments the morphological record of fossils. And then there's a biological signature in something as simple as the isotopic composition of carbon. So some of you will know that uh, on the modern planet, carbon atoms come in, if you will, three flavors. 99% uh, of all carbon atoms are carbon 12, which has six protons and six electron or six neutrons. Um, but about 1% has an extra neutron. So it has a molecular weight of or atomic weight of 13. And then many of you know that about one part per trillion is carbon 14, which is radioactive and breaks down on a time scale that is rapid relative to thinking about the early earth. Uh, what you see in this diagram is a plotting through time of the carbon isotopic composition of carbonate rocks and of organic matter that is in those rocks. And if you go to the Bahamas or someplace like that today, you'll find that there's about a 25 parts per thousand difference in the isotopic composition of organic matter versus carbonates from the same environment. And that occurs because during photosynthesis, organisms for kinetic reasons preferentially take up the lighter isotope carbon 12 
by a predictable amount. And so what we learned by looking at the carbon isotopes of Spitzbergen is that there was a biological carbon cycle at this time. I could tell the same story for sulfur and there was clearly a biological sulfur cycle as well. So stepping back then, we can look at modern microbial ecosystems and see what kinds of evidence can plausibly be preserved in the rock record and how we might interpret that. And when we go back through time in these rocks from Spitsbergen, we find that the fingerprints of biology are everywhere. So that's good news. There is a deeper record that we can investigate. So the question is, how far back can we go and do this? So another place that I spent several field seasons during, particularly during the 1990s was Northern Siberia, where there are beautifully preserved rocks that are now twice as old as the ones in Spitsbergen. These are about 1500 million years old. You can see in the upper left there, these are beautifully preserved. Many of them are as flat lying today as they were when they were deposited. And again, they contain fossils. So you can see cyanobacteria uh, in that orangish specimen, the, a 10 micron bar. There are eukaryotic cells of this age. There are carbon and sulfur isotopic signatures. There are molecular biomarkers. And again, there are stromatolites. I, I actually love this picture in the lower left because uh, it shows my late friend and uh, field partner, Misha Senekatov, uh, who had the great uh, property of being precisely two meters tall when he had his hat on. So he's a great guy to actually have uh, give you, giving you a size marker when you take pictures. Now, if you look to Misha's right, you'll see kind of a bun-shaped structure, which is about a meter thick. And you might say to yourself, well, that looks like a microbial reef. And you're right, that is a stromatolytic patch reef. But if you actually look at the ground beneath Misha's feet, you'll see that that whole area he's standing on is itself domed. And that is a stromatolytic reef that would be I would say the size of a large house. And if you look at the wall behind him, that consists entirely of stromatolites, which make up a reef system that would be, I would say as large, probably larger than the museum that we're celebrating through this series. So again, 1500 million years ago, there is much evidence of life in many different ways preserved in many different environments. So let's go all the way back then to some of the oldest rocks that we can look at profitably to ask questions about life. Uh, this shows the uh, beauty of field work in Western Australia, where there are rocks nearly three and a half billion years old. And if we look at those rocks, what we find in the few carbonates that are preserved in that succession are stromatolites. I hope you can see to the left of that uh, uh, 15 centimeter marker that you have a kind of a conical structure. Uh, the laminations that we see there are influenced by microbial communities. So there was life present at the time these uh, rocks formed. Because these rocks have been subjected to elevated temperatures and pressures, what geologists would call metamorphism, we don't have an in situ record of biomarker molecules, but carbon isotopes preserve very well. And in, in these rocks and in rocks of comparable age around the world, we still find this difference between the carbon isotopic composition of carbonate rocks and the organic matter inside them that tells us there was a biological carbon cycle three and a half billion years ago. Uh, it's a little more complicated, but I think one can make a good case for a biological sulfur cycle at the same time. The question of microfossils per se is, is a little bit fraught in rocks this age because these rocks have been subjected to post-mortem alteration and anything they preserve that might be biological is very simple and may or may not be diagnostically biological. So what you see on the left is just a shard of laminated organic matter preserved in cherts from 
three and a half billion year old rocks in, in South Africa. And you can see that within that shard are, uh, you know, 10-ish micron spheres. Are they biological? Well, they might be, but one sobering thing is to look at younger rocks where we have evidence of post-mortem fluid flow, hydrothermal fluid flow. And it's pretty clear from those specimens that you actually can have uh, fluid flow can mobilize carbon and it then reprecipitates as spheres. The things that you see on the right there are not fossils. Those are uh, organic spheres that formed by postmortem hydrothermal processes. And it's very difficult to rule that out for much of what we see in the Archean, in these early rocks. So I think what we can conclude is that the evidence that's available to us tells us that three and a half billion years ago, Earth was a biological planet. There are more isolated and in some senses more contra controversial evidence in still older metamorphic rocks that suggest that life could easily have been present four billion years ago. And so the first order conclusion is that Earth has been a biological planet for most of its history. Now, there's a lot we don't know about those organisms, but we do know one thing about them. And that is early ecosystems operated in the absence of oxygen gas. Now, you might ask yourself, how is it that we can actually say something about the composition of the atmosphere and oceans as it existed say 3 billion years ago? And it turns out we can say quite a bit because there are various types of minerals and, and elements and isotopic ratios that are sensitive to the presence or absence uh, of oxygen. Uh, one of the most important, uh, which you see in the upper right is something called banded iron formation. Uh, these are rocks that are common in stratigraphic successions older than 2.4 billion years old. You certainly find them in India as well as these in, in Australia. And this kind of rock simply cannot form today um, in principle, because in order for this kind of rock to form, you have to be able to move iron through the oceans in solution. And that can only happen if you don't have any oxygen in the water column. Interestingly, there's a huge decrease in the amount of iron formation after 2.4 billion years ago. It's also the case, as you see in the lower right, which is a uh, uh, an image from a sandstone deposited about 2.7 billion years ago. Uh, that, sand, that grain that you see is kind of golden colored because the sand grain consists largely of iron pyrite or fool's gold, uh, an iron sulfide mineral that is very sensitive to oxygen, even in close, small quantities. So that grain was weathered from a source on land, carried down through rivers and deposited in a delta without ever coming in contact with oxygen at levels as low as 1% of present atmospheric abundance. And then there's a bunch of chemical, uh, more abstruse chemical uh, markers as well, but they all say the same thing. And that is that there was only limited local transient evidence for oxygen before 2.4 billion years ago, but between 2.4 and 2.2 billion years ago, Earth went a, underwent a fundamental transition to a planet in which the atmosphere and surface ocean were uh, contained oxygen. Why did that happen? I won't go into it in detail, although I'd certainly be glad to discuss it. Um, there is a biological component of that. The only uh, source of oxygen large enough to oxygenate the planet is uh, what we call green plant photosynthesis, although it's better to call it cyanobacterial photosynthesis. So you had to have cyanobacteria pumping oxygen into the environment. And there's reason to believe that Earth's changing tectonic or physical setting uh, was important as well, as this is a time when there's increasing evidence that Earth's earlier state as more or less a water world was changing to something more familiar as large areas of continents became emergent as they are now. So in any way, in any event, there's this fundamental change 
in the Earth system at this time. Um, how much oxygen accumulated? The answer, at least in the long run, is not much. Um, for more than a billion years after the great oxygenation event, there was probably only something on the order of a percent or so of oxygen levels in the atmosphere and surface ocean. And the evidence from a variety of uh, chemical signatures is that in most places over this long interval, uh, subsurface water masses remained oxygen free. Now, in this new so-called Proterozoic world, we have a basically new introduction to the biological diversity, and, and that's the eukaryotic cells. Uh, what you're looking at is simply a uh, little panorama of fossils from various places, and you can find evidence of these in India as, as well, of organisms whose organization, ultrastructure, um, size, although size is not itself diagnostic, tell us that eukaryotes of some sort existed as much as 2.7 to 2.8, I'm sorry, 1.7 to 1.8 billion years ago. It's not easy to interpret those in terms of living groups, but eukaryotes as a group was now part of Earth's ecosystems. And as you go upward through time, and again, we see this really in all places that uh, contain Proterozoic rocks, we have an increasing repertoire of uh, eukaryotic fossils. And at least some of them, we can say something about their biological relationships. So in the left, that simple multicellular structure that you see, a little more than a billion years old, and it is diagnostically a red alga. Uh, there's also diagnostically green algae of almost the same age. If you go to the lower right by late in the Proterozoic, but still before we start seeing animals, you see uh, complex red algae. Uh, in the upper right, you see a vase-shaped fossil on the left and its modern counterpart uh, described by Susanna Porter. And these, which are abundant all over the world in rocks from about 720 to 780 million years ago, uh, many of these are fossils of uh, amoebozoans, which is a group related to slime molds and more, more distantly to us. And they tell us that there's protozoa in these oceans and not just algae. Uh, there are, and we'll come back to these, um, a diversity of scales from scale forming eukaryotes. So as we go upward through time, we see this increasing diversity of the world that will eventually lead to the evolution of animals. Now, one can ask, why do we actually see, particularly in from about 900 million to, to 600 million years ago, why do we see an increasing diversity of eukaryotes? And one idea is really informed by thinking about the later so-called Cambrian radiation of animals. And it has been argued, I think, <coughs> compellingly, that that an, an early animal diversification was driven at least in part by ecology, particularly carnivores. So that uh, animals that eat other animals became specialized as predators while prey organisms uh, became specialized for avoiding predation. And <clears throat> there's reason to believe that the advent of eukaryotes, single-celled eukaryotes that eat other single-celled eukaryotes might have had a similar ecological influence on uh, eukaryotic diversity before the rise of animals. And what you're seeing in, in the uh, right here is a, a beautiful series of images from the website of Pierre Casson, and it basically shows an amoeba eating a yeast cell. And that kind of structure uh, is perhaps a, an important driver of eukaryotic evolution. Uh, there's reason to support this from comparative biology. What you're looking at here is just a, a, a molecular clock for eukaryotic diversification from Parfrey et al. I was one of the et al's. Um, and the th four major groups of eukaryotes that actually eat other eukaryotic cells in uh, the oceans today all seem to radiate, you know, roughly speaking, between a billion and 800 million years ago. 
And fossils actually support this. Again, here are these amoebozoan type of cells. On the upper right is a modern uh, testate amoeba, and there's the, the uh, test or shell, if you will, and there's an amoeba-like cell in, inside it. Uh, many of these are very distinctive and can be related to modern uh, amoebozoans that actually eat other amoeba. You can see that in the upper left, where on the left of that series is a fossil from the Grand Canyon that's about 740 million years old. And on the right is a uh, modern amoebozoan. And, and then, you know, you might ask, why would you bother to uh, armor yourself? And defense against predation is as good an answer as any. And in support of that, Susanna Porter has shown that sometimes these uh, cells actually have little half moons cut out of those. Those are not just penetration of crystals. Those actually relate to um, eukaryotic predators. A, a modern group that does this is called vamp vampiroid uh, protists. And then probably the most diverse evidence for eukaryotes before the rise of animals are uh, mineralized scales that these particular ones described by my former student Phoebe Cohen uh, are found in 800 million year old rocks from Northwestern Canada. And again, they tell us that there was, were diverse groups of single celled eukaryotes that were putting energy and materials into making armor. Uh, just to give you some sense of that, uh, many modern protist groups uh, make scales of various types. I particularly like this one on the right from Willy Feusner in, in uh, Vienna. It's a ciliate cell and it's completely armored by organic scales. And so we see that coming in around 800 million years ago. And interestingly, one can ask whether the increasing diversity of multicellular organisms that we see at this time and multicellularity in general among eukaryotes might be related to this increasing predation pressure. And I'll just quickly point out one uh, experiment, and there's a bunch of these in the literature, where in this case, people took single-celled green algae, chlorella, introduced a protozoan predator into the uh, cultures, and within 10 to 20 generations, those algae stably came to exist in eight to 16 cell clusters. The reason is while the predators could eat single cells, basically they could not eat the multicellular structures that were heavily favored by, by selection. And so one can actually ask if the very early stages of multicellularity, even in animals, might have their roots in a, a defense mechanism. Um, that actually helps us, I think, to think about the origins of, of multicellularity. It's probably not a unique driver of multicellularity, but it helps us explain those early stages in undifferentiated multicellularity that had to precede the more complex multicellularity that we see in animals today. So finally, by 575 million years ago, as it says here, the age of animals was upon us. We start seeing fossils of structures that are unfamiliar, but are thought to be simple animals that gain their nutrition by uh, either in individual cells capturing particles or by so-called osmotrophy, that is the absorption of, uh, of, of organic molecules, sponges and some other organisms feed like this today. Uh, they exchanged gases by diffusion. There were no differentiated um, tissues for this, but that's the kind of thing we, we start seeing. And interestingly, uh, at about that same time, we see evidence for the beginnings of another increase in oxygen in the oceans that would eventually lead to the kind of richly oxygenated ocean and atmosphere we see today. That's important because large organisms require more oxygen than microorganisms. And so it in some ways makes sense that we should start to see large energy requiring animals at a time when the atmosphere is in fact changing. But there's one more thing that happens on this time scale 
And that is there's a big shift in who's doing the primary production in the oceans. Uh, this is a beautiful paper published a few years ago by Hoshino et al. Uh, the main et al is Jochen Brox in Australia, who again, I'm proud to say was a postdoc in my lab. And they looked systematically at organic rich rocks from about a billion years ago into the Cambrian. And what they see, if you look at A here, before say 650 million years ago, while you have biomarkers including that include some sterols in places you have no sterols that are related to eukaryotic algae or it's very few by the time you get to the early ediacaran you know a little more than 600 million years ago there's one place that has a relatively high abundance of sterols made by green algae and trace abundances elsewhere but from about 600 million years ago through into uh, the, the Paleozoic era, basically every specimen that they looked at that preserved sterols shows, shows us that green algae were important primary producers. And that's consistent with the actual fossil record in which you start seeing diagnostic fossils of the main uh, photosynthetic green plankton groups uh, on the same time scale. So, what would be the consequences of that? And, and we, if we look at the ocean today, it turns out that, you know, where there are very few nutrients, cyanobacteria, these photosynthetic bacteria are still the main primary producers. And as you get more nutrients, you start getting more primary production by larger eukaryotic cells. The little model that you see on the left is from a, a paper I did with a wonderful, uh, uh, ecological modeler that follows at MIT. Basically, the y-axis is um, biomass. The x-axis is nutrients. Uh, and the first line is very small cells. Uh, when there are few nutrients, it's all very small cells. But as you increase nutrients, you actually build in new populations of larger cells and then larger, and then larger. And as you get larger cells and more nutrients, the amount of energy that makes it up into the heterotrophic parts of the community increases. So in a sense, then what this transition between a cyanobacteria-fueled ocean and a green alga-fueled ocean is telling us is that there's more nutrients and therefore more food for things like animals. So it may be that an important aspects of the evolution of early, early animals are that they are living in a world that's unprecedented. There's more food, there's more oxygen, and it can, that bodes well for animal life. Kind of one of the last things, and then I'll, I'll, I'll finish up, one can ask, well, why would that happen? Why would that happen 600 million years ago? And the, a place that I find attractive to look at is phosphorus deposits, um, well known as fertilizers, so we know a lot about them. Uh, phosphates to me have been wonderful because some phosphates that I've worked on in China are just full of wonderfully preserved microfossils. So it's an important record there. But what's interesting about phosphates is that if you look on the on this diagram in the on the right, the yellow diagram shows us that while phosphates are deposited as rocks throughout the Proterozoic uh, eon, really only about 600 million years ago, there's a state shift. In fact, this uh, deposit that you see on the left, the Doshanto formation in China, contains more phosphate than the entire record of phosphates for all of previous Earth history. There's a big change. And that's important because phosphate commonly limits primary production in the oceans. Now, why might that happen? Well, it turns out that what some people would argue is the largest mountain building event in the history of the planet, so-called Pan-African orogeny, happens on just this time scale. And so you might think, oh, we have these big mountains, really in some ways, the biggest mountains Earth has seen up to this point. The erosion, weathering and erosion of those would bring more phosphate into the sea. And, and that's true, 
But the problem is, if you look at the diagram below uh, the map, that really only a few percent of the phosphate used by uh, organisms in the ocean for photosynthesis comes from weathering and erosion. Most of it comes because organisms uh, die and sink down to the deep ocean where mostly bacteria will uh, essentially eat those, freeing up the phosphate and the phosphate comes back to the surface by upwelling. I won't go into it, but there's reason to believe that that upwelling link in the phosphorus cycle was very weak through early earth history and that through a series of feedbacks in which more phosphate coming in from these mountains led to more primary production, led to more oxygen and oxidants like sulfate, uh, which led to more remineralization, which led to more uh, upwelling. And that spins around and the consequence is a, a more modern, highly productive world. So don't worry about the details, but just know that all of these important biological events that are associated with the earliest history of animals are set within the context of major changes in the physical earth. Of course then, by about 540 million years ago during the early Cambrian period, we actually start seeing life in the oceans that's at least broadly familiar. You have trilobites, those that golden uh, organism in the upper center, which are part of the phylum arthropoda, which includes shrimp, lobsters, insects. Today, uh, in the lower right, there's evidence for mollusks, the group that includes snails and uh, bivalves, clams. Today, uh, in the lower left, there are various types of annelid worms, a group called polychaetes, which are abundant in the oceans today. Uh, in the upper left, the wonderfully preserved organism from, from China, which looks because of these scales like a, a Viking funeral ship, but is in fact an extinct relative of a group called velvet worms today. And even again from China, there are early jawless fish in rocks of the Cambrian period. So with that, we have established something of a modern earth biologically. And I simply point out that that event that establishes this, the so-called Cambrian explosion, occurs about 85% of the way through the history of life on this planet. Okay, finishing up then the punchline. The most important part is that through the work of many, many people, including people in India, we can reconstruct the deep history of our planet, both its physical history and its biological history. And as Ritesh uh, told you, I've uh, spent a fair amount of my time in the last 20 years doing the same sort of thing from, from uh, rover data on, on Mars. And we can now actually do comparative planetary history based on studying other planets the way geologists study uh, the early history of our own planet. There's no question that life and environment have interacted through Earth history and major biological transitions both track and drive environmental changes in Earth, Earth history. So I don't think we can understand the physical history of our planet without including life. And I'm confident that we can't understand the biological history of our planet without setting it within the context of physical Earth history. Now, that dynamism in the physical Earth continues. Uh, these are just a couple of panels that give us a little sense of environmental change during the age of animals. Uh, as most of you know, in the upper left, uh, Earth is a planet characterized by plate tectonics, which means that the geography of oceans and, and continents changes through time. Uh, what you see in the upper left is simply a diagram of the Earth as it is thought to have existed about 250 million years ago. Notice that almost all of the continental area is aggregated into a single super continent called Pangaea. And as a consequence of that, there is an ocean that is larger than a hemisphere in dimensions. Uh, in the lower left, we have evidence from various types of proxies that the atmospheric composition has continued to change. This just shows that there have been major changes in carbon dioxide levels through time. Uh, in the upper right, one of the consequences of that is that we've had a series of ice ages. This is just a diagram of what the Earth is thought to have looked like 20 
thousand years ago when there was two kilometers of ice at this place where I'm uh, speaking from today in, in Boston. And then there are short-term events. I, I love this diagram on the lower right because it shows two dinosaurs out for what will certainly be their final date. And they're looking at this beautiful uh, extravaganza in the distance, which is in fact the uh, impact of a large asteroid which precipitated mass extinction. So sometimes Earth continues to be influenced by uh, solar system level phenomena. And then finally, uh, as Ritesh mentioned, and, and I, I think you're all aware, uh, we live right now in a time of change, environmental change that is unusual in terms of Earth's history. Uh, what you see here in these diagrams put together by a man named Jim Barry at the Monterey Bay Aquarium in the United States is not the amount of CO2 in the oceans, but the rate of change of CO2 uh, in the oceans and atmosphere over the last 400,000 years. And you can see in the upper diagram, it's boring, it's boring, it's boring, it's boring, it's boring. And then we get to the industrial age and it becomes really interesting. Um, related to that is the rate of change of the pH of the oceans uh, through that same interval. Again, not much happens and nothing directional happens until we get the big CO2 buildup that begins with human activities, and that gives rise to a decrease in pH called ocean acidification. And just as you know, major volcanism has induced rapid buildup of CO2 in the past with dramatic and bad consequences for uh, biological diversity, we are living in an age when human activities are um, doing much the same thing. The difference, of course, is that with will, we can actually change how, how we do things in a way that will preserve our uh, biological heritage for our children and grandchildren. So with that, let me just th say thank you for your attention. Thank you to all of the teachers and students who are in many ways responsible for what I told you today, colleagues, sponsors, and I'd be glad to address any questions if people have them. Thanks a lot, Dr. Noll, for your wonderful, informative, and uh, knowledgeable expression that you have given today. So I hope all of us liked it a lot. And uh, of course, uh, there must be some questions. And uh, Dr. Arya, what would you like to say on that? Uh, <clears throat> thank you. We are just enjoying the cake. Ritesh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Hello, Ritesh. Uh, it's Mukund Sharma here. Okay. Uh, Mukund uh, yeah. Sharma. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I like this to... is Dr. Mukund Sharma. He's from Birbal uh, uh, Sani Institute of Pilipsa. I know Mukund Sharma. Nice, nice yeah. to hear from you. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned about a lot about the animals. And I'm particularly interested about uh, the advent of fungi, uh, uh, peripherans or the sponges. Do you mm -hmm. have any idea that when did they evolve? You know, that, that's a very good question. And, and the, the issue in some ways is that some sponges preserve well because they make mineralized skeletons, either of silica or, or carbonate. And we have a good record of those, but some sponges don't make mineralized structures. And so they tend to have a very poor fossil record. Um, so I, I think there is good evidence that sponges are present during the so-called Ediacaran radiation of the, you know, beginning 575 million years ago, although we really don't see, I think, unambiguous spicules until very close to the uh, beginning of, of the Cambrian. Uh, there is biomarker evidence, uh, some sterols or steranes, which is the geological uh, derivative of sterols that have been uh, inferred to to uh, represent uh, smaller or uh, earlier sponges. The problem with those is that there are also some rhizarian protozoans that make essentially the same compound. And so there's some uncertainty there. Um, molecular clocks tell us that sponges may have differentiated from other animals as early as 750 or 800 million years ago. 
And there is a, was a paper fairly recently that you, you may know, McLean, which is by uh, uh, Elizabeth Bob, Turner, yeah. and in which she sees these kind of what are interpreted as reticulate. Vermiform microstructure. Yeah, and yeah, I, I, th I think there, there's at least three things to say about that. One is um, I, I would challenge you to look closely at that and actually see reticulations. Uh, it's not clear whether, the, whether they are there. Also, there are organic walled fossils uh, in the Lakhanda biota of Russia, which are reticulated structures. And they're not sponges. Uh, what they are is, uh, you know, who knows? But, you know, even if, if Liz is correct, and she may be that these structures that we, she sees are reticulated and anastomosing, it is not clear that they are sponges. So I guess what I really, all this boils down to is that while sponges are an important part of the Cambrian explosion uh, and must have a deeper record, um, exactly how deep that record goes, at least to me, is uncertain. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Mukul Sharma. Uh, do we have any other questions? Hello, sir. Yes. I'm audible to you. Hello. Yes, yes, you are audible, Yogma. Huh? Yes, uh, I'm Yogma Shukla from Bibasani Institute. Mm -hmm. And uh, sir, uh, listening to you is like music to our ears. <laughs> and yeah, and sir, I'm also working on arcane sediments of India. So mm -hmm. I would like to ask that according to you, uh, which are the most convincing evidence, means oldest evidence of life or signatures of life? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, as you know, through your own work and, and work of others, that in these very old commonly metamorphosed rocks, it isn't easy to make strong statements about life. Um, I am convinced from work that I did with uh, Abby Allwood, uh, an Australian woman who describes stromatolites from the Warawuna group in Western Australia, that at least some of the structures in those nearly three and a half billion year old carbonates are stromatolites that reflect microbial influences. And one of the reasons I'm, I'm confident in that is that after she finished her PhD, Abby spent a month in my lab in which we just looked at thin sections. And I think at the microscopic level, there are features of those stromatolites that I showed a picture of that are diagnostically biological. Now, having said that, if you actually go into the field and, and look at these areas, there's abundant evidence for abiotic carbonate precipitation, no question about that. So one has to be careful, but I think that those stromatolites tell us that there must've been a biological life on, on earth at that time. And, and I think that the carbon isotope record, particularly if you have both carbonates and organic matter, um, it's very difficult to replicate that record without invoking a you know, biological carbon fixation. So I think those two things are, are the best. I think microfossils to date, and I've described things as microfossils in my youth, but I, I think those are perhaps the, um, the, the, the most uncertain of the major lines of evidence. So stromatolites you are talking about means uh, like uh, that Israeli pool is from a life, but there was a lot of debate about Newtonian's paper. So well, there are, and, and I, I always go back to some work that David Wasey, who has been a great skeptic of biological stromatolites, he kind of says, well, you know, most of those carbonate, most of those structures in the Archean of Australia are physically, he says, oh yes, that stuff that all would describe, yes, that's biological, but the rest, most of it is abiotic. And, you know, I actually agree with that. I, you know, I've seen some remarkable physical structures in early Archean rocks. On the other hand, there are textures, both at the outcrop level and at the microscopic level in Strelly Pool and in rocks of broadly equivalent age in South Africa that are simply hard to reconcile with a purely physical structure. 
Thank you. And so I'm, I'm curious, what are, what are you finding in your Archean rocks? So I'm working on stromatolites, and uh, I have published a paper on uh, stromatolites of iron and ore group of India. So, mm -hmm. so uh, we have uh, found isotopic ratios and uh, that shows that biological activities was there and some uh, texture and structures was also there. So, yeah. and uh, recently, uh, actually, I visited Dharwas of India and I found very good arcane structures okay. from there also. Interesting. No, I, I think this is great because so, for so long, the debate focused only around Australian and South African okay. rocks, which have, you know, there's some advantages of those and some disadvantages. And I think, you know, looking at places like India, some parts of China, some parts of, of extreme northern North America can, can only enrich our knowledge. But I, but I think what we're going to find is what I think many people have thought for, for many years, and that is as we go backward in time, we actually run out of a record before we run out of evidence for life. So w whatever the details are, life appears early. Okay, sir. So I'm trying to uh, establish uh, that structures as biological stromatolytic structures, and I'm working on that. So, good for you. That's great. Okay, thank you, sir. Well, uh, good evening. Can I raise a question? Sure. Uh, well, I am Dr. Prakash, uh, retired from GSI Bangalore. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I have a particular question. Uh, your slides uh, showed, and it's all also well established that uh, during lower Proterozoic and middle Proterozoic. And also during uh, Paleozoic, the CO2 levels went up to say 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 ppm. So during those days, it is clearly linked with uh, extensive volcanic eruptions of those days. The CO2 enhancement in the atmosphere and then volcanic eruptions are clearly established in the past. Presently, what the climate scientists are projecting, the increase in CO2 level from 350 ppm to 430 ppm presently, pre-industrial to present day, say 2020 or 21, uh, how much is anthropogenic and how much is uh, volcanogenic CO2? Now also we see a lot of volcanic activity around the world. Nearly 40 to 45 volcanoes are erupting every day. So how much we have to account for uh, volcanoes and how much we have to uh, account for uh, CO2 emissions uh, anthropogenic? Sure. No, that, that's an important question. And I think we actually have good data that tell us the answer is it is overwhelmingly human activities. And one way to look at that is to look at the carbon isotopes of car carbon dioxide in air. Um, that has been done, a um, man named Hans Seuss started doing that in the 1940s, and so there's a long record of isotopes. And it's very clear that as the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere has gone up, the amount of C13 in the atmosphere has gone down. And that is requires a particular source of, of CO2 Volcanism is ruled out because it does, volcanic CO2 has the wrong isotopic composition. Uh, from C12 and C13 alone, it could be chopping down of biomass or it could be burning of fossil fuels. But we also know through long-term measurements of C14 that as the amount of CO2 goes up, the amount of C14 goes down. So most of the CO2 that's going into the atmosphere has is depleted in C14, and that means it's coming from uh, fossil fuels. So I think you know, knowing that volcanism is an ongoing process, a there's no evidence for increased volcanism that could account for the change. Uh, while I'm mentioning it, there's there have been uh, measurements of solar luminosity over the last hundred years, and that does not provide an explanation for global warming. So I, I think without question, we are in a dilemma of our own making in which CO2 is changing, making the earth warmer, sea level is going up, um, the oceans are 
dropping their, their pH. All these things are associated primarily with the burning of fossil fuels. Well, uh, in continuation, I would like to answer, uh, uh, put a question to you. What is the residency period of CO2 in the atmosphere? How long it can stay, say a thousand years, a lock years? Uh, what is the cyclicity of the CO2 in the atmosphere? Yeah, it, it's somewhere uh, in the thousand to 10,000 year range. And what, what's important, I mean, what, what's important here is that uh, human activities have dramatically changed the rate at which CO2 is introduced into the atmosphere, but they really haven't changed the rate at which CO2 is removed from the atmosphere. So the net result is that CO2 rises. And because of that residence time, and you're absolutely right to ask about that, if we stopped producing CO2 tomorrow, and we won't, um, it would be you know, thousands of years before natural processes would remove that CO2 from the atmosphere. And for that reason, there's a lot of investment in many different countries now in projects by which uh, one can actually scrub CO2 from air. Uh, and th they seem to work. Um, at the moment, they're expensive and nowhere near scale. But I, I think it's, it is probable that um, if we are to be able to manage climate in a way that uh, is beneficial for our, our descendants, um, part of that will be enhancing the human um, capacity to actually lower CO2 rates through tech, CO2 levels through technology. Now, why there is no earth scientist or a geologist in the IPCC panel on climate change? Oh, there are. There, there are lots. Uh, in fact, I played a minor role in the, in the biological uh, work or headed up by Hans Otto Portner. So no, I, I think it's unfair to say that there, there's no earth scientists involved in this. Now, are we projecting the paleoclimatic changes, persp geological perspective of the climate change? Well, I, I think, you know, what, what earth history tells us are two things. One is that times when climate changes rapidly are rare. Um, you know, sometimes climate change deniers say, oh, well, climate is always changing. In a sense, that's true, but it changes on, you know, through time on million or 10 million year timescales, whereas, um, you know, the mean temperature of the earth has gone up by more than a degree in my lifetime. And so this is happening fast. And also one of the things we can, we can actually infer from the geologic record because we have independent estimates of CO2 levels and, and temperature change is really how much change we should expect for a doubling of CO2. And that, that really does populate the kinds of models that uh, you can see it see online. So there is, there is, I think, an important role for biological change. And, you know, I'm, I've been quite taken. Um, one of the things that I did many years ago was argued that volcanic rapid increase in CO2 at the end of the Permian period, 252 million years ago, drove the largest known mass extinction. And you know, since that time, I've actually been working with uh, physiologists, marine physiologists, who are, you know, they're they're not that interested in the deep past, but they're interested in the the future. And it turns out there's there's actually a very strong resonance between the effects of very large scale volcanism. This is things that are a million times larger than anything ever seen by human beings, and and human activity. So it's a it's another place where knowing something about the past, you know, contributes at least to uh, an understanding of what the future might hold. Well, thank you. Thank you. Sure. So do we have any other questions? Yeah, I have one question. Yes, Dr. Jagmohan. Dr. Jagmohan is from ONGC, Oil and Natural yeah. Gas Commission. Yeah. I have been a micropalantologist for the oil company. So the, my question is related, having worked in the three billion years 
life on the earth. Uh, and then uh, region of oxygen and a period before oxygen and a period after oxygen. What do you think at what time the maximum oil might have been generated in the history of Earth? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. Um, as as you, you probably know, but most uh, of the people on, on the Zoom may not, is that while there has been petroleum discovered in Proterozoic rocks, uh, for example, in the MacArthur Basin in Australia, there's petroleum in 1600 million year old rocks, but it's in very small quantities. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think some of the oldest commercial uh, petroleum basins are in Ediacaran rocks. And, and that's consistent with this idea that for reasons having more to do with tectonics than anything else, there is a change in global productivity around the end of the, the, the Proterozoic. So while you know, I wouldn't rule out finding small uh, petroleum basins in, in older rocks, my guess is that uh, important petroleum discoveries in the future will mirror those of the past in being in rocks that are from the Ediacaran period and younger. So you mean the some people who are working on much older rocks, they feel they believe that the it's an inorganic region for the oil. Do you do you agree or disagree on this? I, I'm sorry, could you ask that again? The, some of the people who work on very older rocks, they feel that the generation of oil is through some inorganic process. Do you agree that some of the oil might have been inorganic also, or you agree that fully it is organic the way? we normally think in India. Yeah, I, I, you know, this has been around there. There was a man named Tommy Gold, who was a, a, a very good chemist and not a, not a very good uh, geochemist, who, who argued that, that much of the petroleum that has been uh, discovered as a non-biological origin in, in the mantle. Uh, I think we know enough about that petroleum. Uh, you know, it's full of biomarker molecules uh, so I, I, I think that while I would not say categorically that it is impossible to generate petroleum by abiological means, I would say that, you know, overwhelmingly the petroleum that uh, we have, we have uh, discovered and, and exploited over the last hundred years has a biological source. And if there is a biological petroleum generated on the early earth, um, it is unlikely to be of economic consequence. Very well said, very well. I agree there. Yeah. And then uh, one more question I had. Okay, anything else? Yeah, it's okay, it's okay, thank you. Uh, so, Andrew, it was like, uh, I think everyone enjoyed your cake. <laughs> 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 and I have uh, just a few questions, you know. Sure. So when uh, when we were just planning for this museum, you know, as, as we just, uh, we were just discussing. So, so the main question is, uh, how do we explain to children, you know, because I, I want to make this a uh, museum for the children, you know, maybe anything, anyone for uh, fifth, sixth, seventh grade coming to the museum understands how the earth evolved, number one, then from the gases, from the meteorite, from the, and how the volcanics, volcanism came, then how nuclear reactions came. So putting all this in one picture, you know, and making it so simple, and then how the gases actually solidified, and then making that, and then how the water came, and then making the cycle of uh, water, and then the uh, the the uh, the air. anaerobic environment was there, and then water, and then some chemical reactions taking place between maybe phosphorus, nitrogen, sulfur, as you said, sulfur, sulfur, so carbon cycles. Maybe everything was coming, and then we have some 
molecules which you are which you which you have <laughs> successfully showed us you know so how uh, this cycle to explain to the children you know maybe we talk very uh, so making it uh, it's so just can you just uh, elaborate on this aspect and then we come to the oxygen uh, first water and then the uh, anaerobic environment and then the chemical reactions and then putting this in maybe two or two frames and then uh, because i'm just concerned the, because i i was just delighted when i uh, saw your profile and uh, you agreed to give a talk on this this makes a lot of sense to uh, for the museum i'm making you know this aspect is very difficult to deal with you know yes no, it, 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 it is and there's a lot yes. of things we, yes and then water and then know. the life yeah just can you just uh, put the sequence right yeah, well, I, I think the important thing that, and, and I think a uh, school child could understand this, is that all the planets in our solar system formed early in the history of the solar system by the accretion of materials. Mm -hmm. And we know what those materials were made of because there's some of them still are out there called you know, asteroids. And, and we have some of these materials come to Earth as meteorites. And so because we can study meteorites, we have some sense of the materials that gathered together through gravity to form the Earth. And what I find interesting about those materials is that they contain water. I mean, that's where, that's where the water on this planet comes from. Uh, and, and again, this isn't important for, I think, a school child, but it's, it's generally not water you could drink. It's called water of hydration. So it's actually uh, bound to, into mineral, mineral structures. Um, but water, there is carbon that comes in from, from certain classes of meteorites. So basically everything that forms the earth and the entire potential of the earth to become the planet that it did results from that accretion. Now, the next thing is that as the earth accreted, it heated up and actually melted on the inside. And that would have driven much of the water, the carbon, the nitrogen from earth's interior out to the surface and that is the origin of the atmosphere. And as the earth cooled enough that the water vapor condensed out of the atmosphere, that's the origin of, of oceans. So I think at the level of, uh, you know, say a 10 or 12 year old, it's probably enough to say that the earth accreted from materials very like those that we can study today as meteorites, that the early earth would have heated up to the point that things like carbon and uh, water would have been driven off to form a, an, an early atmosphere. And that as the Earth's surface cooled, that would give rise to an atmosphere probably not too different from our own, except there would have been no oxygen and probably a lot of CO2 because you need that greenhouse capacity for a, a faint early sun and it, and it gave us water. So I think that's as far as I would go. Um, and then of course, biology joins this very early in, in Earth's history. And, and you know exactly how you explain the origin of life to uh, a 10 year old is, uh, that's an issue, but I think I might do it by showing the example of what's called the Miller-Urey experiment. Which it's experiment? It's called, yeah, the Miller-Urey experiment, which uh, is the most famous experiment in origin of life works done by the late Stanley Miller when he was a graduate student in the 1950s. And what he did was took a flask and into that flask put CO2, ammonia, water vapor, and methane and then ran a spark and then he did that because he thought it might be the atmospheric composition of the early earth and then ran a spark through it which was to simulate simulate lightning 
and he formed amino acids. You know, the building. That, that's interesting. I, I remember reading this in, uh, in, in my class, you know, maybe in seventh, eighth grade. Yeah, this was an experiment. I, I remember this. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's, you can, among people who are interested in the origin of life, you can have a three day discussion of what's right and wrong about that experiment. But I think what it shows is that it is not only plausible that the building blocks of life can form in non-biological ways from simple precursors probably present on the early earth, but it's an experiment that any high schooler can do. Yeah. So I, I think maybe that without, you know, avoiding the issue that there's a lot we don't know, but at least that work and the 70 years of laboratory research that occurred because of it, it at least shows that um, you, it's, it's not crazy to think that uh, the materials of biology could form spontaneously on the early earth. And, and again, we know they do. If you look at meteorites, you know, there, there are some meteorites that have as many as 70 different kinds of amino acids in them. So this is not some you know, very improbable chemistry that happened to happen. This is a chemistry that happens throughout the solar system, if not the whole universe. Yeah, that's interesting. So uh, the thoughts which I have in my mind, I just want to share it with you, just correct me. If, uh, so maybe uh, uh, when this nebula, the, the gases, you know, or the solar nebula, the earth system, when it was evolving, so this gases and this lightning happened. And then the rocks, one of the question is how was the first rock formed? So maybe, maybe when, when this lightning happened, then the chemical reactions started. And uh, may, maybe we got different elements aligned different and then the whole thing starts, then we have the radioactivity. But how was the first rock formed and how was the first water formed? And maybe this cycle of Bowen cycle then the chemical reaction starts and we have the water in the end. Maybe that is how uh, the rock series were formed and the igneous rocks were formed and the water was formed simultaneously and then another lightning taking place and simultaneously when th things were happening with water, some molecular activities resulting in formation of light. So everything, maybe, what, what is your opinion on this? You know, Maybe the, yeah, first I rock, mean the first rock, how it was formed from the gases and how... <laughs> So that is like, because these are the questions I'm, uh, I'm thinking that they are, going, they are going to ask me, you know, the first rock, okay, you're, you, you're talking about the geology museum, but how was the first rock formed? How was the first water formed? So first yeah, rock was water, but if we say that it was from the meteorite, yeah, maybe meteorite comes, but the quantum of water which we have on the earth, it, 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 is, it is a substantial amount of water, and, but it is possible to explain the first rock on this earth and the first water by this ex experiment, which uh, which which was which you are talking about, you know, the gases, the lighting, and the rock series forming on one side, the water forming on another side, and the biological processes taking place in another side. So the three processes taking place simultaneously, and we have three cycles, and all of a sudden, this whole beautiful planet was born. May maybe I think this is this could be this is what I was visualizing, you know. But how to put it on the uh, uh, on on paper and uh, on uh, this this is like troubling me, you know. And then the life forms which you said, the slides which you showed, wow, Anna. But, Look, but, um, but uh, uh, okay, I, I I think in terms of the formation of the solar system, there are two things to keep in mind. One is temperature, and the other is gravity. So we know, and we know that this happens around other stars and can be, can be observed, is that early in the history of the formation of a star, you know, much of it from a nebula, gravity brings fairly rapidly most of the constituents of that nascent solar system into the center to form a star. But some materials, dust, which is various types of minerals, uh, ices, ice of CO2, ice of water, ice of ammonia, those form and are kept in orbit around this, you know, most of the mass which goes into the, the star. And, and then gravity kind of 
takes over and two particles will collide. And now you have a single particle that has more mass. And so that becomes something that uh, gravitationally attracts another particle. And through time, you get a small number of um, bodies, which will eventually be planets, which accrete that way just simply by the gravitational attraction of, of other particles. Um, and that gives rise to the planet. Now, I think at that point, it will contain water uh, in the form of these hydrated minerals. It will contain uh, carbon and things like this, probably originally in the form of ices. And then I think most of the magic actually happens after that accretion, very early after the accretion, when heat from both accretion and radioactivity melts the interior and you know we start differentiating the hard materials of the earth a lot of the iron will sink to the center of the earth to form a core uh, other materials will form minerals that we find today in the mantle um, some of the, the carbon and the water and the nitrogen will come off to the surface eventually to form an atmosphere and oceans. So I think most of what's happening, including the origin of life, postdates the physical accretion of, of the planet, um, but takes place under circumstances that simply don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so, so this is quite interesting, you know. And uh, the the uh, next important thing was like the mass extinctions, you know. Well, they're important because, you know, someone who is 10 year olds today may actually witness one uh, if we're not careful. Um, and so I do think that this understanding that at least during the age of animals, there have been turns out five times when in a very rapid uh, succession, a majority of Earth species disappeared. It happened. And, and, and again, one of the things that drives me crazy about, you know, basically climate deniers is they say, well, yes, there's mass extinctions, but then everything comes back. And that's true, but it comes back on a time scale of millions of years. I mean, any species that we lose in the 21st century are, you know, without question, they're essentially gone you know, through any expected lifetime of the human species. So I, I think it's, it is very useful for students to know that our planet is sometimes a dangerous place and it's becoming a dangerous place again because of human activities. Yeah, but, but uh, I, I have slightly a different opinion on this, uh, Andrew. I have been working in Ladakh for the last now almost like 30 years, 25, 30 years, you know. And uh, this 2007, uh, we, were, we were exploring groundwater resources for uh, in the high altitude cold mountain deserts for Indian Army, the civilian populations. So when I first came, like it was like, how do we explore? Because in the books we had read, groundwater needs trees and trees will just soak in. And here there was like cold mountain deserts in the highest altitudes in the world. So when we were doing this, in 2007 and 2008, we had this, uh, IPCC coming up in a very big way, saying that man responsible for uh, climate change. Now we were drilling, we were drilling these borewells, you know, in the in the suture uh, in the suture zone, and uh, so initially we were just uh, exploring the samples, the borewell samples for groundwater exploration, and then after reading that, I just read that in a newspaper, and then I just started studying those borewell samples for the glacial impact changes for the past so many years. So if we say that global warming started around 11,700 years uh, as it is believed by the uh, climate change, and then we started analyzing these samples and we were able to discover the Indus glacier extending, then we extrapolated from Mansarova to Arabia, Arabian Sea, the Indus Glacier. And uh, then we had this Khadungal Glacier. We saw that it uh, receded about 23 
0.4 kilometers in the last say 11,700 years. We had studied, we did some experimental bore wells in Siachen, uh, that is in the uh, Karakram range across uh, the Indus Sucha zone. And there we saw again 74.5 kilometers of recede uh, in the last uh, say 11,700 years or when we, so this was like a, a phenomenon. And then we, we were able to document some extinct glaciers in Lama Yuru. We had some glacial lake outbursts, but all these things happened. The major glaciers extending 5,000 kilometers, 3,000 kilometers, maybe 30 kilometers, maybe 100 kilometers. They happened much before industrialization. And at that time, yeah, that is what I'm, that is my point. That is my point. We were able to document uh, some climate cycles here. So uh, I can, I can sh uh, share that paper with you. But, uh, but the important thing is, at that time, the rate of receipt of glaciers was, I would say, 100 times more than what we are witnessing at present. Because the 29.4 kilometers of Khartoum Glacier, I'm, I'm present in, presently working in Ladakh, still I'm uh, giving this uh, seminar in Ladakh, from Leh. So we can document that and only peak of it is remaining in Khartoum. So it is very much clear, we can study all these things here and very little happened after industrialization. You know, industrial impact here started about uh, the actual industrial impact in uh, Leh started say about uh, maybe about 20 years back. And uh, still, uh, still the glaciers are there. They are receding. Majority of them have become extinct, but they've become extinct much before industrialization. And the, those which are on the verge of extinction, they are due to uh, industrialization, but the pace is very slow. So there is a lot of discrepancies between what is actually we are hearing from Arctic, Arctic reports, Antarctic reports, and what we are practically seeing in this high altitude cold mountain deserts of Ladakh. And we have got very strong evidences, borewell samples, geomorphological evidences, and uh, the glacial evidences here. So maybe there is a point because when we are talking about Himalayas, so Himalayas, we have about 2,400 kilometers of volcanic activity, which led to the formation of the Himalayas. You talked about Siberian, uh, uh, Siberian traps, which led to Permian extinctions. We had uh, Deccan traps, which led to the dinosaur extinctions, you know. So may, major volcanic activities uh, uh, are responsible for that. And, and the contributions of oil in this is, is I think, uh, what fossil fuels we are using is, I think, very negligible in compared to the volcanic activity, which will happen. Because these volcanics, what, what the volcanics which we are happening, which are happening today, are just negligible, again negligible, as compared to the volcanic activity which leads to mass extinction, the Siberian, the Deccan traps, the Himalayan volcanic uh, 2,400 kilometers of volcanic activity. So that is the amount of volcanic activity which can cause environmental or extinctions. But these human activity and these tidbits, the volcanic activity in Iceland, Indonesia, these are just like, uh, okay, Earth is showing that yes, it is active, but uh, these are not the active volcanic activities or the human activities which can actually play any role uh, 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 in mass extinction or any impact on climate change except for causing pollution. Yes, but these two things have to be dealt and differentiated at a very, very strong level. We need to pollute, change pollution, but climate change has to be th thought in a very, very scientific way and in a very, very practical way. And uh, I think that we can have a different uh, seminar or a webinar on this, but I congratulate you for giving us a piece of slice of the ancient life, which uh, normally we find it very difficult to, because I have been working in fossils. I, I, I also like, uh, but you started at the age of 12. I started at the age of, I think, 21. <laughs> 21. So, but I had been working on the mega fossils, but these uh, micro fossils, had fascinated me a lot and uh, I had been in touch with Mukund Sharma and uh, in Chitrakut we were able to find very about three four meters and five meters of area as I told you stromatolites so maybe uh, now I think interest uh, is there after your talk and maybe I'll request you to make a simple and a more uh, talk for the children
if it is possible uh, let me think about it yeah so uh, and you know uh, thank you very much for the interesting talk and uh, i think we do we have any other questions could i just respond to one of the things you actually said yes because yes, i think it, it yeah, to, yeah, to be honest sure, i think sure. it may be misleading sure, sure. Sure, um, sure. I, I am not an expert on Himalayan glaciers, uh, and there's no question that, you know, as we went from the Pleistocene to the Holocene, there are, are major changes. But the fact that something happened 11,000 years ago does not mean that nothing is happening today. That's logically flawed. And I think if, you know, I, I can't speak for the Himalaya, but I know through photographs of the Alps, of Mount Kilimanjaro, of the Greenland ice sheets and that, that within my lifetime, there has been substantial loss of, of glacial mass. We know that within our lifetime, there has been substantial change in, in sea level. We know that within our lifetime, there has been substantial changes in populations of everything from insects to mammals. Uh, you know, I, I think, the, the fact that there have, have been changes in the past should not blind us to the idea that there are all sorts of things, including pollution. I think you know, pollution is a major source of death in the human yep. population. Yes, you're right. Um, but I, I, I think we really need to, to deal with all, all of these things. And I, and I, I, you know, we can just agree to disagree, but I, I would, uh, push back on the idea that uh, climate change is negligible. Climate change? Yeah, I think climate change is going on now. Yeah, yeah it's is, going on now. Global it, warming is, we, are, we, are, we are in a global, we are in a global warming cycle, yes. But, uh, but my, my point was like, uh, uh, and the global warming cycle started, say the actual global warming started around 11,700 years. That is what, uh, uh, it is general belief, generally believed from the ice cores, uh, ice cores which the Danish uh, uh, research team is doing. So they have just published about uh, uh, papers and uh, that is the baseline which we are taking. But if that baseline changes, then definitely the timing will change. But uh, till then, we yes, glaciers today also, there are remarkably uh, decreasing and decreasing, decreasing. So I made two points, you know. Majority of the glaciers in Himalayas became extinct much before industrialization. Second point was today's glacier are receding and are on the verge of extinction, and they gradually they will gradually become extinct. So we have two points: industrialization, majority of the Himalayas glaciers extinct, and second, what glaciers we are remaining, they are on the verge of extinction. So it is happening. What you are saying is happening. And I also believe in that one. But putting everything on industrialization, because everything, major glaciers means, I'm talking about glaciers which are 1,000 kilometers. I'm talking glaciers which are 100 kilometers or more. And what we are, and 30 kilometers. And what we are changing, changes in the last 100 years we have seen is, or maybe before industrialization or after industrialization is, say, uh, I'll tell you an example, because... Uh, there is a fort here built by Zorawar Singh and Zorawar Singh visited this place, Ladakh in 1839. And this fort and uh, was built on the glacial belt, Khatungla glacial belt. So at that time, we can assume that there was no glacier there. And South Pole means that is about to say seven, uh, eight to 10 kilometers ahead. Also, there was no glacier. So that is the amount of, and whatever peaks which we have can be documented in a, a, a here, you know. So this perspective also has to be taken into consideration. So this is, yeah, we can have different opinions, but yes, yes. You have any point? Yeah, no, I, I think we're just gonna have to- Okay, agree. yeah, yeah, that's okay. We're but uh, but uh, again, going back to what you said, we really enjoyed your talk. It was quite interesting, enlightening. And I think uh, it, it, it opens our uh, view to the life and the, and, and, and the way we see, we should see the limestone, limestones and the phosphorites, you know. And they hold a key to a better way of understanding our evolution and the life, how they originated. Normally, as a, <laughs> because we generally ignore this, you know, 
but but i think bsip people are doing wonderful job and i think uh, uh, in india now we we uh, i think mukund sharma and his team or someone else had just found something some uh, of the oldest fossils in uh, in the peninsula part and uh, with more and more research and more and more uh, 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 people coming into this field i think india holds a, a good uh, start for understanding the the missing gaps about the evolution of life so i i, I do you have any last no, uh, quote or word no just uh, to thank everyone for for participating and thanks for the opportunity to meet with everyone thank you andrew all then i think it was wonderful okay bye 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 everybody bye bye thank you very much